Hello, you fine internet folks. We're here at CES 2025 with AMD, as you can see. And uh, the big AMD announcement was this. Strix Halo um, being productized as AMD Ryzen AI Max. Um, and we happen to have a system with one I need. So, but not just that, I happen to have... Mahesh. Mahesh Subramani, um, senior fellow AMD. And what do you do at AMD? Um, I am part of the, I'm a technology advisor for the client business unit. Mm -hmm. um, but for the better part of the last decade, I, um, I was an SOC architect okay. for various chips within Kathani AMD. So let's start with Strix Halo. Let's start with the CPU side, Zen 5 cores. And what's different about the Zen 5 here compared to, say, I don't know, desktop Zen 5? Yeah, I mean, first off, I think um, putting that chip together mm -hmm. um, has been has been in a life's dream, that, you know, over the time. I think ever since we, we did the, the merger a long time ago with new ETI to bring graphics, um, you know, in-house, we've always talked about building you know, a big APU of sorts where we could match the CPU performance and the GPU performance on a single package and deliver that in the form factor that you see today. And took quite a few iterations to kind of get it to, you know, where it is right now to get that, to get that right um, value that we thought bring to the end user. And um, and yeah, so it took four iterations to get here. And, and so we're glad we're here. And it had to check a lot of boxes um, because at the end of the day, it had to, meet the needs of the consumer and so we're very aware of that um the cpus on on here uh, they have the same dna it's, just, it's still zen 5 it's still the same architecture but um we needed to pay more attention to power so the ccds that are featured to a first order in the in the desktop part they have an actual phi mm -hmm. that connects the two uh dies and so there is um there's actually a distance that it, it, it needs to travel it's it's a 30s um, and you're able to go some distance uh, between the two. That's how we've always connected the two. And that's a, a low cost interface, if you will. Uh, it is a high bandwidth interface, but that had low power states that could only take it so far. And you had retraining and latency implications every time the chip went down and came back up and so on. So for an always on kind of a desktop kind of machine, that seemed like the best uh, interconnect uh, to connect that. As we tried to build this into an APU, mm -hmm. um, we had the first thing we had to do was to choose the interconnect between the two dies. And so the CCD that you see here, the core die that you see here, has a different die to die interface. That's the first change. Um, that's a, a, a sea of wires. Mm -hmm. We use uh, fan out, wafer level fan out, in order to connect the two the two dies. So you get the the lower latency, the lower power. It's stateless. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're able to just connect the data fabric through that connect interface into the CCD. So the first big change between a, a, a Granite or a 99, um, 950X3D was this, was this the Strix Halo is the die-to-die -die interconnect, low power, mm -hmm. same high bandwidth, 32 bytes per cycle in both directions, lower latency. So everything that, you, and um, almost instant on and off, stateless, okay. because it's just a sea of layers go across. So um, it, it's a little, of course, the fabrication technology is more expensive than, mm -hmm. than the one over there, but it meets the needs of the of the customer and the fact that it has to be a low power die to die And um, are the FPUs in the Strix 5, uh, Zen 5 cores, the full 512 bit uh, F FPU, or is it like Strix where it's uh, similar to Zen 4 where it's 256 bit? This machine is intended to be a workhorse, right? It is a workstation. Mm -hmm. it, I, I almost joke about it, saying it's a thread ripper in the palm of your hands. Uh, so we didn't pull any conscious. I just have the 512 bit data paths. It is a full desktop architecture. Okay. Um, we have um, binned the paths for efficiency, so you might not hit the peak frequency that you would see on the desktop. That's one of the second differences in the cores you would find over here and the cores over there. They're colder, mm -hmm. binned, so you get the efficiency that you would like on these parts when you run multi-threaded workloads you're able to get a higher effective frequency on these but what you give up is some peak uh, uh frequency which i think in a in a thin and you know form factor that you have today you don't have the thick 
cooling solutions that you would see on a desktop part anyway. So the demand of, of the form factor says that, you know, you need cores that are cooler, if you will, lower in that FP curve where you can extract efficiency. So these are binned, approved the same architecture, mm -hmm. uh, the same set of pipes, the data parts are the same. The differences are in how we bin the part and how we connect the two routes. Now, moving from the CPU over to the, the big, huge SOC tile over here that holds your iGPU. Now, I know that this wasn't mentioned in the slide deck, but there's 32 megabytes of what's known as MOL or Infinity Cache. How does that react with the CPU cores? So can the CPU cores access that 32 megs of cache? It cannot. Okay. And so, so let me let me make sure I make that the statement very clear. The mall exists to amplify graphics bandwidths. I think that's that's the intent of it. Yep. So, the only um, compute engine right now that can, I mean it's, it's a flexible allocation policy. You should mm -hmm. start start with that. But the intended the, the way it is configured right now is writes from source from the GPU installs into the mall. Okay. CPU writes do not install into the mall. Okay. Can be changed with a flip of a bit, but okay. we don't see an application right now where we need to amplify CPU's bandwidth. Yeah. Um, so we reserve, and we, there were times when we have worked on carve outs for say display or video encode decode to kind of say, hey, look, can I have two slices of the mall kind of be, be a, a place where the VCN or the video encode decode or the display can kind of play, or even the inference engine to store some weights. So we have played around with what can and cannot allocate into that that structure and the way it is defined right now um, is is where only the GPU installs into the mall. Now as we um, explore more and more applications, you know, it's a software release where we can release a firmware that says, hey look, we have changed the comp the configuration of how the mall is going to be set up. Uh, so much will be reserved for the GPU and hey we decided to carve this out for another compute engine, an NPU, a um, the video encode, decode, or display, and now you're going to get X amount of speed up, X amount of battery life, you know, so on. So any agent can install into it. I want to make sure the flexibility, the architecture exists, but the way it is defined right now, we've run a few use cases right now. We feel the best uh, um, use of that mall is for graphics to use it as a bandwidth amplifier. So graphics is the only compute engine with a flag set where all writes install into the mall now. The mall is coherent, mm -hmm. so when a CPU access comes in, it does check the mall to say, hey, is the line existing over there? Because it's a write that is waiting to be committed. And it either says, no longer, because somebody else asked the line, so let's just forward that, that data over to whoever asked for it. Um, so it stays coherent. It is part of the coherent fabric. Um, every write to memory, there's a lookup into the mall as well. It's a, it's a, it's a cache that we need to look up as well. But um, from a, from a, a point of view is who gets the most benefit from that mall. It is the GPU. It writes into the mall, and uh, depending on the the traffic pattern, if there are more hits onto the mall, you you, you get that read bandwidth amplification. Which in certain scenarios we've seen that to be double digit uplifts, right? So we we are going from a GDDR memory that exists in a discrete solution to LP. So we understand we are undersized, but the mall acts at that as that uh, amplifier. So for large for a large GPU that, that we have over here, 40, 40 uh, compute units, uh, you know, it's the perfect use of that mall is to give it that, that amplification. And speaking of that coherency, um, is that essentially, is that, is the mall acting as your last layer of coherency for all your uh, compute units? Uh, no, that that is still what what we call it's a it's a it's a block in our data fabric uh, that sits right before the memory controller. Okay, that acts as as the as as the place where uh, as the point of coherence. Okay, all memory accesses. So memory is um, um, divided up into you know based on its interleaving. Yep. Here are the different controllers that if you want to access this line, you have to go to this controller mm -hmm. and the data fabric. IP that sits right before it saying, hey, any access to whatever is behind me comes to me. I'm the point of coherence for all lines below. Okay. Now I am going to check the pro filter structure to see if the, 
the, the CPU has the line. I'm going to check the mob to see if that has been installed in here by some cat. All point of coherence runs through those, uh, those data fabric IPs that interface with the memory controllers. So that's, that stays as the point of coherence. So in that regard, it's uh, I, very similar to Strix, right? Is it very similar to... It is a participant in coherency. Yeah. It is not the point of coherence. Okay. 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 And speaking to, again, to the data fabric, um, are you seeing any clock speed benefit from the fact that it's just a sea of wires connecting the CPU to the SOC tile? Um, you, you, we are able to get power benefits. Okay. Because prior to that, we had a PHY, mm -hmm. GMI PHY that, that lived in there and that consumed a whole lot of power in order to be able to send this over high frequencies over mm -hmm. short distances. Here we are clocking it at a at, at way less than the 20 gigs that the GMI was was being clocked at. This is anywhere between you know one to two gigahertz. You know, really uh, clock rate matched to the data fabric itself. So there is no um, asynchronous interface here where you have to pay a whole lot. Of, it's it's just mapped to directly the, the the fabric. So at a lower voltage, you are able to because we use the sea of wires. You, you are able to get that that high the bandwidth match it uh we 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 wait we uh, spend the area in terms of the wires that need to come through but we're able to clock it at, at meaningful meaningfully lower speed so you get the power benefit um can we clock this even faster well there would be no need for it if we don't we are not able to clock memory faster as well remember there is no ddr here like mm -hmm. desktop where you have OC and you're able to push this higher and higher. So moving the fabric clock gets you some benefits. This is LP. It's a little tends tends to be less conducive to overclocking. So being rate matched to memory um, in a mode power efficiently, that was the target rather than trying to push fabric clock. But yeah, we have more flexibility here if you wanted to. And, and so sort of to end this conversation back where we started at the CPU yeah. with that fabric, how much memory bandwidth can the can a single CCD access since it's it is thirty two bytes per cycle reads? Um, it this really comes down to um, we can have a single CCD saturated. You don't need both CCDs. You can have a single CCD saturated DRAM bandwidth. You can have four cores, even two cores if you write the right stream benchmark uh, saturated DRAM bandwidth because the the CPU can issue a request every cycle. Um, the CCD that each mm -hmm. CPU can request an issue every cycle. So you're going to see that and eventually you are going to get pecked back by how quickly a response can come back and a response can come back once every, uh, depending on, you know, where it goes and how, how the response comes back. You're eventually going to get clogged by how quickly the memory requests are draining on the, mm -hmm. on the, on the UMC side of the memory controller side. So we have one to two CPUs being able to get close to saturating DRAM bandwidth they want to do with the right stream bandwidth going into open pages and so on and so forth. So, um, but again, uh, with the right mix of the right mix of traffics between reads and writes, like, like I said, a couple of CPU threads can saturate bandwidth. So it's not, um, but again, when it comes to bandwidth, we believe the NPU and the GPU are the ones that benefit more, uh, from a CPU standpoint, I think latency and latency under load, uh, 15 to 20% load, but still not have that hockey stick in terms of latency just jumping up so we're not faking it that only the first request gets the lowest latency and everybody else does not take the bypass paths and pays, pay, uh, pays heavy penalty making sure you have steady low latency for the cpu high bandwidth for gpu and NPU. and to finish off the most important question what's your favorite type of cheese oh <laughs> uh, gorgonzola is that yeah is that a is that an answer is a good answer yeah the gorgonzola ravioli i think it uh <laughs> But yeah, you know, shout out to to uh, to a restaurant back in back in my hometown. I think it's it's a bit well, nice. Thank you so much for this interview, Mahesh. Always a pleasure, George. Absolutely. 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 Well, if you like this sort of interview style, hit like, hit subscribe. It pleases the algorithm god of YouTube. So uh, yeah, have a good one, folks.